should we start all right um good afternoon everyone uh welcome um so in the recent times there's been an undeniable buzz around large language models some of you would have perhaps encountered this in discussions articles or maybe even experienced this firsthand because of the remarkable capabilities these language models have to offer but despite this excitement some of us may find us hesitant to dive into the world of LLMs, held back by the perceived complexity of deploying and utilizing these powerful tools. So let's get started and dive into the realm of large language models and hosting our own models locally to harness the full potential of large language models with your projects and workflows. Oops. <laughs> Okay, all right. So before we deep dive, I'm gonna take a moment to introduce myself and my co-speaker. Uh, my name is Akanksha Duggal. I'm a senior data scientist. I now work on the Instruct Lab project. And, and I'm Hema Viradi, and I'm also a data scientist working at Red Hat in the Emerging Technologies team. Awesome, so, so what's the agenda of this talk? So first of all, we'll go over what are large language models, then we'll talk about some open source large language models, then we'll give you a small overview on the steps that are required to build a large language model application, and we'll go slightly over the concept of self-hosting your large language models, and uh, having said that, we will also talk to you about setting up your own large language models using Podman, and uh, followed by a demo and set of question and answers. So let's get started. I'm sure most of you know what large language models are, but I'd like to still take a step back and introduce us to the science of language models first and then talk about what la large language models are. So what is a language model? It's a type of machine learning model that is trained to conduct probability distribution over the words. And simply put, it just tries to predict the next most appropriate word uh, to fill in a blank space in a sentence or a phrase. So the job of a language model is to approximate a function that fits the input data. If the input data is one dimensional and follows a linear trend, a simple line function like this is sufficient to fit the input data. But if the input data is a natural language or an image, we need more advanced architectures to approximate the same. So there are a couple of different types of language models. Uh, so there's statistical language models that are type of models that use statistical patterns in the data to make predictions about the likelihood of the specific sequence of words, like probabilistic models, uh, like the language probabilis probabilistic models uh, uh, are used to calculate the n-gram probabilities. Similarly, there are neural language models. As the name suggests, they use neural networks to predict the likelihood of a sequence of words. These models are usually trained on a really, really large corpus of text data and are capable of learning the underlying structure of the language. And what are LLMs, or large language models? These are just a larger version of language model language model is more generic than a large language model, just like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. All, all large language models are language models, but not all language models are large language models. So LLMs are special type of language models, but what makes them special? So there are two key properties that distinguish LLMs from the other language models. One is quantitative and the other one's qualitative. So quantitatively, what distinguishes a large language model is the number of parameters used in the model. Currently, the large language models have on the order of 10 to 100 billion parameters. And qualitatively, something remarkable happens when a language model reach, reaches that much intensity. It becomes so large and starts to exhibit, exhibit so-called emergent properties like zero-shot learning. And these properties seem to appear when it has reached a sufficiently large size. So for instance, like using these la large language models, you could do tasks like language translation, sentiment analysis, and also identify grammatical errors, spell errors, etc. However, 
because of the number of samples these models are trained on, you don't even have to provide examples in some cases. It just tries to exhibit those properties by itself. So by definition, a large language model is a type of artificial intelligence that is trained on a massive data set of text and code. It allows the model to learn statistical relationships between words and phrases, which in turn allows to generate text translate languages, write creative content, and answer your questions in an informative way. Some of the common LLMs, as some of you must have used by now, are GPT-3, GPT-4, Gemini, Llama, Llama 2, Llama 3 now. So these are some of the large language models and, these, and their applications. But have you wondered, uh, are these models actually open, or do they just claim to be open source? In a recent study conducted by Radboud University, several instruction tube text generators, including Llama 2, underwent scrutiny regarding their open source claims. The study comprehensively assessed the availability, the documentation quality, access methods, just to aim these models based on their openness. But a lot of these so-called open source models did not fill into the criteria. And as these large language models are becoming increasingly sophisticated, there is a growing emphasis on democratizing the access to these models as well. The open source models in particular are playing a pivotal role in this democratization, offering researchers, developers, and enthusiasts like a like opportunity to delve into the deep intricacies, fine tune them for the specific task, and also build upon their foundations. And Having said that, there are different kinds of levels that you can interact with these large language models on. So if you are somebody who has no experience, no technical experience around large language models, the first and the foremost way that you can interact with these models is prompt engineering. So using a large language model out of the box, that is by not changing any parameters, this is the most accessible way to use the large language models both technically and economically in practice. It requires zero to little knowledge to get started with prompt engineering. And even if you are trying to do prompt engineering, there are two ways that you can do that. The first and the easy way is to uh, try a chatbot or any LLM UI, such as ChatGPT. And the key benefit of this method is the convenience. Tools like ChatGPT provide an intuitive, no cost, no code way to use a language model. But, and it doesn't get easier than that. But it does come with a lack of functionality. The user cannot customize the model, uh, the input parameters, or give a data contribution back to these models. You can also interact with these LLMs indirectly. So we can overcome with some of the drawbacks of the UI-based large language models like ChatGPT by inter interacting with them directly with the LLM using programs. So th this could be done using public APIs, you know, like OpenAI also has this API open, and you can also run this locally with your own prompts and a customized model. So we can go over an example in a little bit and share how you can access a large language model on your own laptop without needing a lot of compute resources. We also had a workshop on this yesterday uh, where we helped everyone set up a large language model locally on their machine. Uh, because this is a super easy, customizable, flexible way of getting started with large language models in practice. And we've seen that a lot of these models perform better on the basis of the prompt input that you're giving. So in a study that was conducted some time back, it was seen that the quality of the prompts also change the kind of responses you were getting. So the responses got changed by around 20 to 50% just by changing the importance of this task by the user. The second step to get started with a large language model is model fine tuning. Fine tuning is a process of continuing to train a, a pre-trained large language model on a specific data set which I'll define as taking an existing LLM and tweaking it depending on the use case that you have and train it on at least one model parameter. In the context, context of large language models and neural networks in general, model par parameters also refer to as trainable parameters that the model learns during the training process. These 
parameters are adjusted iteratively through optimization algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent and in order to minimize the difference between models predictions and the ground truth labels. So the fine tuning typically consists of two steps. The step one is to obtain a pre-trained pre -trained large language model. The step two is to update the parameters of a specific task, uh, typically thousands of high quality uh, label examples. And that should be it. And this is a really, really powerful approach to model development because it requires a rel relatively small number of examples and computational resources, and that can produce exceptional model performance. But however, this might require a little bit of technical exp uh, expertise and also access to some sort of hardware resources. Like, mind you, this is like a slightly challenging task if you're trying to do it on a simple laptop with a smaller memory. And the third way is to build your own large language model. Uh, this is the most challenging way to get started with a large language model. This is where you have to come up with model parameters from scratch. And since LLM is a primary product of its training data, for some example, it must be very, very important to curate your own custom data, a high quality text corpora for model training. For example, if you were to do medical research a corpus for a clinical application, that would require a lot of going around, looking for a public data set that should be widely open to use for everyone, etc. So the biggest upside to this approach is that you can fully customize your own large language model for the use case. And it also provides you the ultimate flexibility. But however, uh, as you may have heard, the flexibility comes at a cost of convenience. Uh, and this requires a lot of technical expertise. It requires money. It requires time to train these really, really hefty models from scratch. Um, so having talked about that, let's start building our own large language model application with HEMA. Thanks, Akanksha. So now we'll go over some of the steps for building out any large language model application. So the initial step is like any other project, the planning phase. So in this phase, we are trying to identify the problem we wish to solve. So as Akanksha went over, there are different use cases, different uh, applications for your large language model. So the goal here is to take your time to define what problem you wish to address with your application and consider certain questions like what are the specific tasks you wish to have your LLM perform, who's your target audience, who's going to be consuming this application, and what are their needs and pain points that we're trying to address, so that based on those answers, you can actually figure out how you need to start building out this large language model application. So once we've gone and identified the user problem or the problem statement, we need to start doing all of the implementation and the building phase. So here it basically starts with uh, selecting the appropriate large language model for your tasks. So you're gonna consider certain uh, factors like the model size, the performance, the compatibility with, within your specific uh, domain that you're trying to target. And then finally, uh, customizing your choice of the large language model so that it's tailored to suit your needs. And again, lastly, we need to look at setting up the entire architecture. So as Akanksha was going over, we talked about the different levels of how you can interact with the large language model. So you need to kind of figure out, do we need to do fine tuning? Do we need to do a rag based approach? Uh, how big do we want this uh, application to be scaled out? And based on those uh, decisions, we're gonna build out the infrastructure for it. And lastly, once we've identified the architecture, the platform where you're executing all of this, we're gonna actually implement and run the entire application. And as part of this step, what's important is also to evaluate your large language model application. And to do this, you're gonna measure things like performance metrics, accuracy metrics, to collect feedback from your users, and also uh, subject matter expertise, which you're targeting to uh, utilize this particular application. So all of that is going to come under your last phase. So now that we have kind of gone over what are all the different steps, the question here comes to what our talk is all about. Do we self-host or not? 
So in the rapidly evolving landscape of your large language models, the question becomes slightly more critical now because the more we think about uh, using some other third party infrastructure, the more the costs are going to increase. And also there are a lot of other uh, drawbacks that come with trying to be locked into a certain vendor or locked into some of these enterprise version of these models. And that's where this uh, option of self hosting uh, comes available to you. And what uh, are some of the advantages of self-hosting is that they give you some customization and control over your data, over your organization and ownership. And you also have the flexibility to kind of tailor these to suit your uh, solutions and to suit your requirements. So again, depending upon the use case, depending upon your engineering infrastructure, depending upon your organization needs, you will probably need to think about these decisions accordingly. You may already have some platforms in your own organization or your own um, enterprise where you can kind of host some of these models without having to pay for some of these other larger models models that exist where you're kind of they, they have like the subscription format now where you need to give uh, some certain amount of credits to make those API calls. So all of that is going to add on ultimately to your cost. So one way to consider is to maybe leveraging your own platforms to do this. And um, also initially when you're doing this by yourself, maybe it's just a POC, maybe it's just a very small scale, you're just doing some basic development testing. So for these scenarios, it probably makes sense to minimize the cost and try to do these kind of setups locally on your as much as you can on your machines. So that kind of leads us into this uh, slide where we're looking at some of your benefits of self-hosting. So as I mentioned, you get a more stronger grasp over the security over the privacy, over the compliance, because there is a lot of internal data that's probably being sent to these applications. So if it is private, if it has confidential information, you probably will be hesitant to use some of those third party uh, options because you are not sure where this data is gonna be consumed. So maybe hosting it by yourself might be better in this uh, scenario. And again, it avoids you know vendor lock-in, you save a lot on the computational costs that I mentioned with regards to all of these these API calls that we're doing nowadays. And also, if you look at some of these OpenAI user terms, there are a lot of conditions that might seem a little suspicious. So I encourage you all to kind of sometimes read those carefully before you start sending and make those requests to these uh, OpenAI models that you are trying to use nowadays. So in conclusion, the, this gives you a larger flexibility when you try to self-host them on your own platforms, on your own infrastructure. And with that, there is an option for us today, which is trying to leverage all of those containerization techniques to do some of this self-hosting. So to do this approach where we're leveraging all of those techniques, where you're kind of building your application inside of containers and running them uh, locally on your machines, what we start off with is selecting the necessary large language model. And to do this, we have a hugging face, which I think most of you are, are familiar with. So hugging face is where you can find a collection of all these large language models, and they vary in sizes. And if you go to hugging face, you can kind of pull those model binary files. And again, there are different quantized and smaller optimized size that you can download and pull from hugging face. So we're going to be leveraging that. And once you've kind of selected those appropriate model, again, depending upon the use case that you're trying to build, there are different models that, are, that have been trained and pushed to hugging face that you can pull. So the second step comes the containerization part. So today we'll have a small demo where we're gonna leverage Podman to do this. So we're gonna use Podman to build a container which has all the requirements to run uh, a small uh, audio text translation model. And what this would do is it'll collect those binary that I mentioned from hugging face, run it inside the container, and it'll expose it as a service on your machine. And then finally, you can interact with it within your own uh, system, make some calls to it, and see how the application is running overall. So we're uh, going to do that through these containerization techniques. And then finally comes the model serving part. So 
Now that we have a model that's packaged, that's running as a service, how do we interact with it? So as most products and as most uh, software services that we have nowadays, everything kind of comes with a UI where it's more easier and more intuitive for a user to interact with. Even the common chat GPT like models, you have an in interface where you just kind of give a prompt and it gives you back the response. So we need some kind of way to interact and uh, in call those different services that we are using. So there's something called as fast API, which allows you to inference the service that you have just stood up. And apart from this, you can also set up your own user interface applications. So today we will be looking at a streamlit UI, which has become a very popular interface for all these large language model applications. It's built on top of Python and it's open source, so you can uh, kind of deploy your own UI, which, which is like a very simple interface for you to uh, make those requests to the model. So with that, we'll head over to the demo. So to do this, there's a small repository that we created for the purpose of this demo. We are going to look at a audio to text use case. So what we're trying to do here is, let's say you have a non-English audio file and you want the model to translate it and give you back the English translated output of this audio in the form of text. So there's a very popular model called the Whisper model that's available, which does this uh, audio to text translation task. And those models are actually available on Hugging Face as well. So we're going to leverage those uh, Whisper models from Hugging Face and download that model and uh, build a service out of it using the container technologies. So this is the repository that we're going to be using. And inside this, oh, we don't have the Wi-Fi, but I have uh, cloned it over here. So um, this is basically the main repo. So if we look inside, we have a couple of folders like uh, model folder, the assets, the data, the Whisper model service over here. So if we go into the Whisper model service folder, we have a container file, we have a bash script, and then we have the streamlit folder where we're going to run the streamlit UI. So this is what the container file looks like over here. So what we're doing is we are cloning the Whisper model. And there is a GitHub repo, uh, which, is, which you can see over here. It's the Whisper CPP GitHub repo. So the Whisper model developers have created a C++ service where you can uh, run the Whisper model as a service built on top of C++. So inside this uh, container file, we are basically cloning the requirements from that particular GitHub repo. And then we are uh, doing a couple of commands to kind of go inside that particular repository. What do we need to actually execute out of that particular repo? And that's what we're building inside this container file. And then once it's built, we also need to specify an entry point. So how are we actually going to run this whole thing? So to do that, we have um, a bash script over here. So what we're doing, ultimately, the goal for us to use the container is to serve this Whisper model. So that's what we're doing over here. We're just serving that uh, model binary that we are going to download from Hugging Face. And we're going to locally put it in, in uh, serve it in our machines. And we're going to expose it on this particular port. So that's the entry point that's going to happen once we build the container file. So let's look at some of the steps. So the first step, as I said, we need to download the model from Hugging Face. So this is the uh, link on Hugging Face where the Whisper models are available. There are different versions of the model. So like each version of the model has different size requirements. So we're going to use a small model, which I think is about uh, 466 MB in size. So it can easily fit on your laptop. And once you've downloaded the model, we're going to push it into our models directory. So if you look here, you can see that after I've executed this, I've also already downloaded it beforehand. So this is the model binary file that we have downloaded for the Whisper model. 
So once we have that, uh, the next thing is to actually go ahead and deploy your entire model service. So to do that, as I said, we're gonna leverage Podman to do it. So what we are doing here is you need to first uh, build the entire container file. So to do that, we're gonna do this uh, and then I'm gonna give it a name. So we can just say whisper defconf test. Oh, sorry. And then I need to mention what I'm trying to build. So as you can see, uh, this is coming out of this container file that we've specified and it's successfully gone through a couple of steps and it's uh, pushed it to this particular image which is whisper defconf test. So now that we have the image built, we need to run the entire image that we just created. So to do that, this is the command that we are going to test. And here again, it's just exposing that entire Whisper model service. And here we need to specify the path to where that binary file was downloaded. And then we are just specifying the port and the host to where we want this uh, particular service to run. So if we try it out. So here I'm gonna call this Whisper DevConf test. And here I need to give the entire path to where the uh, binary file was downloaded. So I'm just gonna say this. And my uh, repo directory is called whisper self-hosted LLM. And let's see if that works. Perfect, so now what you can see here is the Whisper model service is up and running and you can see that it's listening at this particular uh, port that is 8001 and of course it's being uh, served on your machine. Now how do we kind of uh, create a way to interact with this? So as I said we have this option of um, a streamlet. So inside this folder you can go into Streamlit. And Streamlit is, uh, again, like I said, it's uh, on top of Python. So this is actually the Python file that I have where we are going to define a very simple front-end UI for uh, interacting with the model that we just served. So this is what that Python file looks like. And then we are going to run this file. So you need to do Streamlit run and pass the file name. So now you can see that it created this very simple UI and it's basically going to ask you to drag and drop any audio file that you would like to uh, generate the text for. So let me, let's try an English one just to see that it's doing what it's supposed to do. The stale smell of old beer lingers. It takes heat to bring out the odor. A cold dip restores health and zest. A salt pickle tastes fine with ham. Tacos al pastor are my favorite. A zestful food is the hot cross bun. So this is just English to English, but at least we can see that we've uploaded an English file and this is your translated text. Uh, very quickly, let me try non-English. So. This is a French audio, not sure how many of you in the room know French, but we're just gonna give it a quick try. Monsieur Gerbois, professeur de mathématiques au lycée de Versailles, dénicha dans le fouillis d'un marchand de bric-à-brac. So again, very short clip, but this is the translated text. So that's the whole uh, demo of how you can test out this uh, audio to text translation again everything's running locally and we're using a very simple approach to serve your models and let me go back to my slides so again um, the future direction of this is to basically enhance the developer experience instead of having to uh, run this using some uh, enterprise versions we want to do it locally and have some end-to-end -end framework around trying this out on your machines and finally, there's a QR code here if you want to try this out yourself. All of the code is available on GitHub. 
Uh, this, there's also a link to the AI lab recipes that's built uh, along with Podman. So you can also check that out. This, this recipe is also available there. So if you want to test it out uh, using Podman desktop, that, that's an option that you can try out as well. So uh, please go ahead and scan that. And when you get a chance, uh, take a look at all of these different resources that's available for you. And with that, thank you all for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm not sure we have time, but. OK. Um, we started a, another tool recently called um, Ramalama. We called it the boring AI tool. But it's pulling in very similar directions, uh, container-based, make it very easy to serve models locally and on servers if needs be. Um, we started with language models and Llama CPP and all that, and uh, we haven't looked into speech recognition and, and Whisper CPP and that kind of thing, but um, we'd love to collaborate with you guys on this, actually, if, uh, if you guys would be yeah. interested in that, because, um, yeah, I think we're pulling in the same direction and okay. we could do something great together. Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, I'll connect with you and, and we can definitely sync up. Uh, just wanted to add here, uh, this is also available uh, in the playground with the Podman desktop. So this is already an installed application. If you were to use something directly without putting this much effort, you can just go to Podman desktop and install the recipe for Streamlit as well. Oh, sorry, Whisper as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I really liked the, the demo, so thank you. Um, I was just curious, I've been out of the automatic speech recognition game for a few years, but I was in the Paris area and I was dealing with it in terms of um, semi-supervised machine learning. And I was curious whether or not in the last like five years or so, things have changed a lot. Have, has ASR de been increasingly dependent on less supervised or non-supervised machine learning or w what has changed if you're familiar? Yeah, I'm not too familiar in terms of like how those methodologies have been evolving or how they've been changed. But uh, we were just leveraging this particular one that came out for uh, the speech recognition use case. So as a use case, we just directly pulled it from from there. But we haven't looked at like separate uh, other techniques or methodologies for doing uh, speech uh, recognition. But yeah. We are just getting started in our, in our AI journey, so we are trying to begin with a small use case, like building uh, a AI-based chatbot and infuse it with our product. In case we are able to um, expand on that further strategically and if we end up building more models, is there any way we can unify the models and just call it one single model that's specific to our company and keep it private? In the sense, are you saying like you are trying to build your own version or? I don't want to start building from my own model. Rather, I would adopt and start small or yeah. build iteratively. Yeah. And then in, when we evolve, if we find use cases, more use cases, can we unify all the use cases under one model? Yeah, definitely can. Uh, so it, it again depends on the domain rather than I think the use case. So the use case can be broadened, but if they are falling under like, let's say like speech recognition is itself a big domain, but it has its specific use cases, like depending upon the certain type of task that you want the model to achieve, the different languages that you want it to support. So as we expand, you can definitely unify them. Again, you will have to uh, think about the different data sets that you're incorporating for each of those use cases and again as you keep evolving any model it's going to get bigger so you, you kind of have to think about how do we scale uh, based on the different use cases that you're trying to unify but I would also uh, mention about the new architecture called an agent framework so that's also another upcoming uh, methodology that can help to kind of route uh, different ways that you want a response to be generated. So the agent is kind of the brain behind figuring out what's the right uh, response or what's the right answer and where should I be, what source should I be pulling out 
to give back the answer for a specific use case. So that's a new architecture that's been upcoming. So that can also be a way that you can unify multiple use cases. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah.